I was uh, treated with FCR in 2000 after being diagnosed in 1996. I was uh, patient number 60 in the FCR trial. Some will argue, doctor, whether anybody has been cured after many years uh, with FCR. So some of my doctors say, well, gee, Andrew, you're in that group that hasn't had any treatment since 2000. Are you cured? So you can talk about that. But anyway, we like that, that C word. Anyway, we have questions we're going to uh, do. And, um, and then we'll have more time for questions after uh, Dr. Follows talks more about where care is headed later after lunch. OK, so we'll reserve some of those. I will just say one other thing related to Gwen. The nurse is my best friend. Because sometimes you can't expect to get to him. He's going to Italy and where he's going all over the place. Many of our doctors are. And that's great. But you can bet that if it needs his attention, in other words, your CLL specialist, and, your, and Gwen feels it needs to be escalated, let's say, to him, she will, right? So that's, that's your best friend right there, OK, is your nurse specialist. All right, let's go on. One of the questions that came up, Dr. Falls, as you mentioned about GPs, or even generally other doctors, other cancer doctors, when do you try really push for a second opinion? When do I push first? No, when do they? When do they try to say, gee, maybe we need to escalate this. We need to, I need to see a CLL specialist or another CLL specialist? Well, the UK health system is probably quite different from health systems you're familiar with. Sure. So the, as we all know, the GP is either a route to specialist care or a barrier to entry to specialist care, depending on your perception. But the, the British system works like that. You have to rely on that referral coming your way. You, so you touched on the primary care, and then there is the haematology generalist care. Right. So that is politically harder for me. I've got to be careful what I say, because obviously the standard UK model is we have haematologists in every district hospital in the country. And each district hospital feeds into multidisciplinary teams that are normally chaired and managed by a university teaching hospital. And the way we've evolved is you get people like me who only treat CLL and lymphoma, in effect, concentrating in your university hospitals who take responsibility for the region. But actually, if a patient is in... Kingsland, Bedford, Ipswich, they'll be seeing my colleagues, and the system depends on the colleague discussing at an MDT and the colleague saying, actually, George, uh, because of XYZ, is there any chance they could pop up to Cambridge for a clinic? Now, you can tell by the way I present, I'm always happy to have chats with people and they come up to the clinic, and actually what I try and encourage is if that is required, they get referred in, maybe just see me the once and then back to colleagues. But there's a, there is a lot of variation and there are, there are a, some barriers to entry at each point in that pathway. Okay, another question we had is a lot of people, different ages here, and you refer to, both of you refer to clarambacil, for instance, as gentler treatment. We also talked about the atypical age of the CLL patient, not in all cases, but in many cases, older. Um, what about sort of ageism, someone brought up, in CLL treatment, where it's recommended they have a less aggressive treatment just based on their age? How do you feel about that, or how do you evaluate somebody's health status so they get the treatment that is right for their CLL? I don't know, either one of you. Well, ageism starts with clinical trials. Because actually, if you look across the board, until CLL11, which the Germans really have to be congratulated on, there were no trials that actually represented the age distribution of CLL. And the MD Anderson are as guilty as that as everyone else, because if you look at the median age of patients, the CLL8 trial, 61. The CLL10 trial, a little bit older, but still down in the 60s. And then along comes CLL11 with a median age of 74 finally actually treating the populations. And I think we've got to be extremely careful about ageism. So Gwyn and I discuss this at, at length. For me, a far more important thing is biological health. I mean, Cambridge, we are the centre of 
profs coming in aged 84 saying, oh my goodness, you know, I've got to be in Milan next week because I'm lecturing on the structure of some protein and skipping in and out, cycling up to the clinic in the 70s and 80s. And we always discuss all options, but you've got to be realistic. The body can cope with less as it gets older. Your, the US guidelines, the NCCN guidelines now say FCR, they don't exactly say contraindicated, should be, say, should be used with extreme caution in patients aged over 70. And it's difficult territory, but when you look at the CLL10 data and you look at infection rates and complications rates with these more intensive therapies, they go up with age. So d I do not want to give the impression in any way of being ageist, but you have to be age realist. So how do people, with changes coming, how should people think about CLL today for their own future? Because it, you said it's not curable, so it sounds like somebody described it to me yesterday, sort of whack-a-mole, you know. Your goal is to try to knock it down. So is there a treatment, long-term treatment plan that they discuss with someone like the two of you? Sort of a plan. We're going to do this now. We may have to do this later. And it's sort of chronic. Yes, it is, isn't it, Gwen? I mean, yes. <laughs> yes, and I think, I think the thing that often needs emphasising as we're going through is that, yes, what we are offering and hoping to get, you know, the best depth of remission or whatever, but, of course, the likelihood is at some point there's, the CLR will come back. But, again, sort of emphasising that there are other treatments and, you know, but, of course, sometimes, yes, it's, it, it's difficult anticipating from the start where we might be in however many years and, of course, what new therapies are on offer. And I think in some ways, again, Dr. you know, always has a very open discussion and, you know, revisits that as, you know, as people are going through their sort of CLL journey, really. So think, what, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I think, so Gwyn knows that the, the standard drawings that come out in my first clinic and these discussions of drawing this graph and say treatment, they put the disease asleep and then, but it inevitably wakes up. And I am a bit mean like that, I say, it inevitably wakes up because there are wonderful examples where it takes many, many, many years, but I'm still quite cautious. And then we always stress the point of evolution of new therapies. And what I like to stress is that if you look historically with cancer, remission durations always shorten, but the new therapies are challenging that dogma. I think that's an important concept that we're moving towards. So treatment with these newer antibodies and then definitely treatment with some of the targeted agents are challenging this thing that your second remission will inevitably be shorter than your first and your third will be shorter than your second. What you were describing with the change with new drugs, maybe we'll talk more about this this afternoon, for instance, related to 17P, you said this is old data, this is old survival data. It sounds like for these folks trying to have expectations, it's very hard to figure out. And heterogen, heterogeneity in the illness as well. And that's it nailed, because it is. And it's so changing when you hear people like John Bird present with his Ohio State data and clearly showing this change. Their historical data of 17Ps, because you brought that one up, but Ash, he showed all their amalgamated data pre-ibrutinib and their ibrutinib testers. There's huge daylight between these curves. So we're only just getting this data through. But as a CLL specialist, the message I have to get across to my patients is, look, this is, you know, you can't promise everything. We can't crystal ball for that individual patient. But this is a very exciting time with real changes that can bring real hope. So where do you start now when you decide on a therapy that you have access to today? Does it shoot the patient in the foot, if you will, and deny them the ability to have any of these uh, newer drugs that may be coming? Yes, well, Gwyn, Gwyn and I have a bit of a two-pronged approach to this, so I will have this sort of technical thing and then I'll make an excuse to leave and then Gwyn finds out really what the patient thinks about me. <laughs> and then we'll come back and report to me. And it, it's just, because you, you are going straight to the heart of the problem. Do you roll that dice and gamble with toxicities earlier when you have this brave new world coming? 
are you the type of person that actually that is you? Because actually you are, you know, you're 55, you've got your business, you've got to be in remission because if you can make it to 60, 62, you'll sell up, the family will be fine. And actually you can't be doing with hospitals and you've talked to me about 5% chance of AML, but that means 19 in 20, I'm going to be fine. And for that individual patient, you might say, great, let's crack on FCR, get it done, get you in a remission, off you go. But I do, Gwyn and I work quite carefully together on this, and I think... Yeah, and again, I think that's the thing. It's, it's you know, having those very open discussions, and of course, in some ways, you know, we will sort of say, to, you know, that this will be quite a frank discussion, so that at least, you know, in some ways, people are armed with that. Sometimes it's almost too much to... And it's like, well, when you come back, you know, you'll have had a chance to absorb that a bit more and we can have those discussions again. And of course, yeah, there will be some patients that, you know, that have got a much more clear idea that, yes, actually, I've got this, I'm symptomatic, I want to get on therapy and, you know, take all of those risks on board. So I think that's it. It's that sort of individual discussion with, yeah, where's but, the patient? But beyond the risk, is there anything about FCR, for example, <clears throat> that precludes you from getting any of the newer drugs as they become available? The, Later. The most feared complication, of course, is marrow damage that gives you myeloid dysplasia or AML, because then you can't be treated, because then your dominant disease is no longer CLL. So point number one, the controversy about Richter's transformation and whether that reflects earlier treatment is a bit harder to explain. I'm not sure that would influence my Could you just thinking. explain what Richter's is for people who don't know? I touched on it briefly in my talk that there is this quite feared translocation to a high, sorry, transformation to a high-grade lymphoma, normally characterized by rapid nodal masses, sweats, fevers, debility, quite a change in the disease. And we endlessly debate, do any of our therapies increase the risk of Richter's? If you look in the ibrutinib trials, for instance, there seem to be this quite high instance of Richter's. And so we throw around at conferences, well, these are people who are dying of their CLL, but because they've been kept alive, they've been able to transform. But of course, actually, if you were being truly objective looking at the data, you'd also have to say, is there any chance a novel therapy could trigger Richter's? And then you hear people say, well, actually, two or three of these, if you look back at their diagnostic scans going on trial, almost certainly they had Richter's at that point. But I think the one thing I do want to finish with that, all of these educated discussions, one of our patients wrote a lovely article in the Lymphoma Association magazine, and it really made me smile because she said, I've met this very nice doctor and a specialist nurse, and we had a really long chat, and I got home, my mother rang me up and said, what did they tell you? And I couldn't remember a single word. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I opened, because I always read the lymphoma session, and, and I took this into Gwyn's office, and I said, Gwyn, if we've got to realise this, that actually, because you can tell I'm a natural enthusiast, so I get a bit stuck in and all of this. And it's probably too much a lot of the time. We probably do have to stage these conversations. Yes, and I think we? we often have that discussion with the patient. And then, of course, you know, often when I'm sort of providing supplementary information, and my often passing the line is, well, we've bombarded you and probably given you far too much information. And, of course, in some ways, we then probably need to recoil and sort of tailor. But I think that's it. I think we sort of have that opportunity. And, yeah, the temptation is to almost but give Gwyn too also, much when we're talking to them, I recognise her body language. She starts shuffling like this. Like, oh, gosh, right. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> we're, does anybody have a, <clears throat> a burning question now? From out here, we're going to be breaking for lunch in a minute. We're going to have more. And we're going to go into this brave new world of how treatment is changing, clinical trials, how do we lobby for access to care. So, but any, right now, have we covered things? Yes, sir. When I was diagnosed eight years ago, uh, there was some doubt on hereditary. Um, it would appear from what you were saying that there's perhaps a bit more been um, researched about hereditary, whether um, my father... He had um, leukemia in the early 80s. I'm not sure what type it was. His treatment was just having blood transfusions every time his red blood cells dropped. Um, has there any, been any further research into perhaps hereditary? So we don't know why there is this linkage, so this increased risk. But the word hereditary, I tend to stay away from because hereditary, you tend to think of, you know, my father had red hair, I've got red hair. It's not that type of thing. It is 
what we call an, an increase over background risk. And it's probably because within this huge complexity of our genome, without being utterly dull, of the 25,000 genes, there are all these variations, huge numbers of subtle polymorphisms. And if by chance you have a collection of 50 of these different ones that co-associate, you're probably more likely to get CLR. Undoubtedly, we'll get more information about this in the future. But because, as you know, within families, these, all these different variations that are the random chance that makes some people blonde, some people dark, you know, et cetera, et cetera, there's that random chance that can slightly predispose, predispose you <laughs> to heart disease, leukemia, that type of thing. But it is a fourfold over background. <coughs> that does not mean hereditary. OK. We have, there's a lot more coming. So, Oh, yes, ma'am. Burning question. Um, a member of my group asked me if I would ask. Um, she has CLL with an immune component, ITP. Um, her hair is falling out, and she's wondering whether this could be connected to the CLL. In particular, is it an autoimmune process? Undoubtedly, CLL can associate with all autoimmune diseases. So autoimmune alopecia, so the where your body attacks hair loss, is actually very uncommon in CLL. But you might find the best thing is to see a dermatologist, and I can talk to that patient if they want to. Okay. 